Right. Well, now that uh, we've got that sorted out, it is a real uh, you know, pleasure to be with you here uh, once again and to spend some time uh, looking, at, uh, looking at the Psalms. So what I anticipate is that I'm going to look really at the, the content of the Book of Psalms largely and see what is there and try to give um, some guided tour through the various ways in which the Book of Psalms um, explores worship and spirituality. Okay. Um, and then at the end, I will look at some um, implications arising from what I've said. Um, when it comes to our discussion, I think we're likely to spend more time um, raising the implications. Uh, at least I, I anticipate that is what will happen, but we'll, we'll, we'll see. We'll see what happens. Now, I don't know how many of you can um, identify with an experience that I've had um, increasingly uh, recently, and that is of, of being in church and of uh, meeting well-meaning and, and wonderful uh, worship leaders in church who all insist that we must smile as we worship, because after all, we are in the presence of God and we have come to worship the Lord and we need to show him how much we appreciate him. And so, you know, Brother Turner, if you could please, you know, raise that frown from your face and smile as, as we sing, because as we all know, worship is about unadulterated praise and everything must be positive. So for us, uh, frustration, doubt, complaints, um, questionings are not at the heart of our worship. In fact, they're barely present. And yet when we come to the book of Psalms, one of the surprising things there, I think, is that it does seem these issues of frustration, doubt, and complaints do seem to be at the heart of biblical worship, if the book of Psalms is anything to go by. So I want to begin in the first part by looking at the various types of Psalms and how they interrelate. In this section, I'm going to expand a little bit on that short piece that was posted on the Adventist Today website before I go on to look at some other matters. Now, there are various types of Psalms, three, very, three basic types of Psalms we're going to look at. And these Psalms arise from different situations in the life of believers and worshipers. Uh, all of us, I think, would agree that our spiritual lives have highs and lows. We are not always there on the mountaintop looking forward at the, at the promised land. And our spiritual lives go through what I've termed the seasons of the soul. Just as in the natural year, we, we move through the seasons, winter, spring, summer, autumn. Um, so in the spiritual life as well, there are seasons of the soul. And the various kinds of Psalms reflect that. So let's have a look at them. And so what we'll be doing is first of all, looking at the what before later on moving on to the so what. So the first type of Psalm, and for these designations, for these titles, I'm indebted to um, the Old Testament scholar, Walter Brueggemann, who's written some uh, very interesting material on this. But Psalms of orientation, what do we mean when we talk about Psalms of orientation? Well, Psalms of orientation set out the basic elements of the believer's faith and relationship to God. So it sets out this basic spiritual worldview, if you like. And we're familiar with this from various Psalms. So Psalm 104, a, a Psalm of creation, you set the earth on its foundations so that it shall never be shaken. So we have a dependable creator. So the creation is dependable 
and that gives us a sense of stability in our lives. That gives us an orientation to life. Psalm 16, I keep the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. So by being in close relationship with God, God will be with me and ensure the stability of my life. Psalm 16, that's another orientation. Or Psalm 97, the Lord is king. Let the earth rejoice. Let the many coastlands be glad. So God is sovereign. How wonderful that is. Let the whole earth rejoice. All right. So these are examples of the affirmations that we find in these psalms of, of orientation. All of these psalms assume God's blessing in the world. God's goodness is a basic element in the orientation that we have, and we find it all around us. But the Book of Psalms is also clear that this is only part of the picture. And if we take these affirmations to be the whole picture, then they become unrealistic. And it's my opinion, though you might wish to disagree with me later on, but it's my opinion that in much modern and contemporary Christian worship, these psalms of orientation are taken as the whole picture. And that, I think, has given us a, a diminished sense um, of worship. Uh, let me, uh, in talking about the limits of orientation, uh, turn to Psalm 91. It's a beautiful psalm, both in the original Hebrew and in translations, wonderful cadences of language. It begins like this. You who live in the shelter of the Most High, who abide in the shadow of the Almighty, will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night or the arrow that flies by day, or the pestilence that stalks in darkness, or the destruction that wastes at noonday. Uh, now, of course, you are all muted, so I don't know how many of you burst out into a, uh, an utterance of amen, you know, when I read those words. But one of the questions raised in the Book of Psalms is, yes, this is wonderful, but is it true all the time, for all people, in all circumstances? Are there times when such wonderful affirmations like this might be questioned by our experience of life? And so it's here then that we make a transition from the season of orientation to the season of disorientation, disorientation. And the Psalms of disorientation are not designed to be sung during the season of orientation. So Psalms of disorientation are usually caused when faith in God's goodness is challenged and when doubt edges out affirmation. So then, Psalms of Disorientation, sung at times when the affirmations of orientation are challenged and simplistic faith will not suffice. For example, and I'm going to use here a quotation from uh, one Psalm of Disorientation that I'm sure we're all familiar with. It's uh, Psalm 22, which was quoted by Christ as he was dying on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me, from the words of my groaning? Oh, my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, 
but find no rest. So this is an example of a, a psalm of disorientation. And as you can see, these psalms often express what we might want to call disappointment with God or disappointment that those affirmations of orientation, the God is good, God is great, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. When those affirmations are challenged and the psalmists make their disappointment known using quite extreme language at times. So one thing is clear from these psalms of disorientation is that they do not advocate passively accepting everything that comes our way in life. No passive acceptance of injustice, for example. So one thing that they don't do is to say uh, that no matter what, it is well with my soul, to quote that well-known hymn. Because when you read these Psalms of disorientation, you discover that for these Psalmists, it is definitely not well with my soul. And instead, they express themselves with, with shock, anger, frustration. I'm going to read the most extreme example of a psalm of disorientation, because I want to do more than just talk about these psalms. I want to read at least one of these psalms in its entirety, so we can get a sense of the, the psychology of the psalmist, the language that is being used and what is actually being said. And I think the most extreme psalm of disorientation is Psalm 88. So I'm just going to read that now. And um, I want you to try to listen carefully to the words. O oh Lord, God of my salvation, when at night I cry out in your presence, let my prayer come before you. Incline your ear to my cry, for my soul is full of troubles and my life draws near to shale. I'm counted among those who go down to the pit. I'm like those who have no help, like those forsaken among the dead, like the slain that lie in the grave, like those whom you remember no more, for they are cut off from your hand. You have put me in the depths of the pit, in the regions dark and deep. Your wrath lies heavy upon me, and you overwhelm me with all your waves. You have caused my companions to shun me. You've made me a thing of horror to them. I'm shut in so that I cannot escape. My eye grows dim through sorrow. I call to you, O Lord, every day. I spread out my hands to you. Do you show your wonders to the dead? Do those who are dead rise up and praise you? Is your love declared in the grave, your faithfulness in destruction? Are your wonders known in the place of darkness or your righteous deeds in the land of oblivion? But I cry to you for help, O Lord. In the morning, my prayer comes before you. Why, O oh Lord, do you reject me and hide your face from me? From my youth, I've been afflicted and close to death. I have suffered your terrors and am in despair. Your wrath has swept over me. Your terrors have destroyed me. All day long, they surround me like a flood. They have come completely engulfed me. You have taken my companions and loved ones from me. The darkness is my closest friend. The darkness 
is my closest friend. Now, if those uh, worship leaders I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation um, were active, and as they sometimes do, invite the congregation to suggest a favorite that everybody should sing. Do you think anybody would raise their hand in the congregation and say, what about the darkness is my closest friend? That always goes down a real treat. I don't think so. This is a psalm of graphic disorientation which might sound quite alien when we consider this was offered as an act of worship to God. Well, we're going to return to the Psalms of Disorientation, but we have not only uh, Psalms of Orientation and this kind of Psalm of Disorientation, on which more in a minute, but there are also Psalms of reorientation. And psalms of reorientation are sung by those who have passed through disorientation. These are sung on the other side of disorientation. So these psalmists experience of disorientation allows them to gain a new perspective for their faith. And to illustrate how these psalms work, I'm going to look at Psalm 73. Uh, we're not going to take the time to read it all, but I'm going to set out for you how it's organized. And psalm 73 begins with a statement of orientation. Truly, God is good to the upright. That's the worldview. That's the orientation. This is the fundamental belief, if you like, that God is good to the upright. But because that is the psalmist's orientation, the psalmist is thrown into disorientation when they look at the world around them. And there are two elements in the psalmist's disorientation. The first is that the wicked prosper. And the second, that the righteous do not prosper. So you can see why the psalmist is thrown into disorientation, because if, if this orientation, truly God is good to the upright, if that is to be accepted, then why is it, he says, that I see the wicked prosper and the righteous do not prosper? Well, that's the first half of the psalm, from orientation to disorientation. But in the second half of the psalm, the psalmist moves on to reorientation. And what he says is, two parts again in the reorientation. He says, you know, now I realize that actually the wicked do not prosper. And really, the righteous do prosper, which enables him at the end of the psalm to repeat something very similar to what he said at the beginning. Notice at the beginning, the orientation was truly God is good to the upright. And at the end, the psalm concludes for saying, for me, it is good to be near God. So the psalm concludes in a similar manner to which it started, talking about the goodness of God or the goodness of being close to God. And we've gone from the disorientation of where life doesn't seem to support the statement of orientation to a reorientation in which all is well. Yet, when, if you look at this, it seems, well, it doesn't just seem, I think it probably is the case, that 
the second half of the psalm, the wicked do not prosper, the righteous prosper, flatly contradicts the first half of the psalm, that the wicked prosper and the righteous do not prosper. What is it that could have moved the psalmist from his disorientation to the reorientation? Well, as you might have noticed, I've omitted the middle three verses of this psalm, verses 15 to 17. And this provides the solution to the conundrum. And here, the hinge of the psalm, the psalmist says, it seemed to me a wearisome task. What was a wearisome task? But getting his head around this disorientation, that was the wearisome task. Until, until I went into the sanctuary of God. And it was in this encounter with God, in this spiritual encounter, that the psalmist discovers the answer to his spiritual problem. So the psalm's approach is to say, if you have a problem with God, take the problem to God. Don't speak about God in the third person. Speak to God in the second person, you. Have it out with God. Speak to God. And offer this as an act of worship to God. So we might want to come back to this movement of reorientation, but I'm just giving this Psalm 73 as an example of how it works in the Psalms. We move from disorientation to reorientation, not through clever theorizing, hypotheses or deep philosophy, but with a divine encounter. Um, right, now, there's something else um, I'd like us to move on to. We've looked now at the three main types of Psalms. We'll be returning in a minute, but I'd also like to look at how the book of Psalms is put together, very broad outline, because that helps um, to understand the Psalms in some ways, I think. As you know, there are 150 Psalms. Psalm one, obviously the first, Psalm 150, the last, and the first and last Psalm act as bookends to the, the, the whole book of Psalms. Psalm one, is a psalm of absolute certainty. And Psalm 150 is a psalm of absolute praise. So Psalm 1 starts, happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked. In all that they do, they prosper. The wicked are not so. The way of the wicked will perish. Well, life is clean, clear cut here. The righteous prosper, the wicked perish. There are no shades of gray here, just absolute black and white contrasts. That's how it begins, the book, absolute certainty. Psalm 150 concludes with absolute praise. Praise the Lord, Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty firmament. Let everything that breathes praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And if you know Psalm 150, you know I have omitted numerous praise the Lord in order to fit it onto the screen. It is just a catalog of reasons to praise the Lord. So the book begins with absolute certainty and concludes with absolute praise. But Israel's life, our life is not lived at the edges of the book of Psalms. We don't live our lives in absolute certainty and absolute praise. And it's in the 
the other Psalms, the other 148, if you like, that take us from absolute certainty to absolute praise, where we move through all of these seasons of the soul, orientation, disorientation, reorientation, the roller coaster ride of being a believer in a fallen world. And um, our lives, our spiritual lives, not just our spiritual lives, are lived somewhere between these two extremes in the heart of the book of Psalms, which explores those ups and downs and peaks and troughs. And that is where we find the Psalms of disorientation. And so what I want to do now is to go back to those Psalms of disorientation and take a look at some of their characteristics. So first of all, then, when we encounter these Psalms of disorientation, what kind of characteristics do we see? Well, we find complaints, expressions of frustration and doubt. Very generally, um, and generalizing, God appears to have forgotten his people, either as individuals or as a people. It appears that he's forgotten rather than remembered, that he is deaf rather than hearing. And that this suffering of his people is undeserved. Now, not all suffering is inexplicable, according to the Old Testament, but some of it is, and that is what people complain about. And that is why the, one of the main characteristics of the disorientation psalms are the number of questions. What proliferates in the Psalms of disorientation are question marks, not exclamation marks, as in hallelujah and amen. So what kind of questions keep cropping up in these Psalms of disorientation? Questions like this. How long, O oh Lord? Will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? Now, at the beginning here, when he says, how long, O Lord? This isn't a rational question. Um, the, the answer the psalmist is looking for is not, well, about three weeks. If that, will that be about all right? He's not looking for that kind of an answer. It's a question, but it's a rhetorical protest. How long, O oh Lord? Or how long must I bear pain in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all day long? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me, from the words of my groaning? Why do you sleep, O Lord? Why do you hide your face? Why do you forget our affliction and oppression? The Book of Psalms makes something very clear. Uh, and here I am going to slow down and maybe lower the register of my voice in order to convey that I am now saying something which I think is very important. What these Psalms indicate, I believe, is this that questions and complaints and doubts are just as acceptable 
to God as an act of worship, as the acclamations, hallelujah and amen. So let me repeat, questions, complaints and doubts are just as acceptable in worship as the affirmations and acclamations of hallelujah and amen. And why should that be the case? I think it's because doubt is not the opposite of faith. Doubt is an integral part of healthy faith. So doubt is not the opposite of faith. The opposite of faith is absolute certainty. We might want to come back to that in questions later on. Another aspect of the Psalms of disorientation is the movement that we see within them. And what we find in many of these Psalms of disorientation all of them sung as acts of worship, remember, is, uh, now this isn't true of every one of them, but most of them, is that they begin with questioning, doubts, frustrations, and complaints. That's where they begin, but they end with praise. Begin with questionings and doubts, but they end with praise. Let me give you a couple of examples. First of all, Psalm 13. Psalm 13 begins like this. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and every day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? But just a few verses later, end of the psalm, it concludes, but I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord, for he's been good to me. So beginning with the questioning and the doubting and ending with the praise. Likewise, Psalm 79, it begins, O God, the nations have come into your inheritance. They have defiled your holy temple. They have laid Jerusalem in ruins. How long, O Lord, will you be angry forever? Will your jealous wrath burn like fire? But the psalm concludes with praise. We, your people, the flock of your pasture, will give thanks to you forever. From generation to generation, we will recount your praise. And so I think it's significant that usually, although not always, usually these disorientation psalms begin with questioning and doubt, but they end with praise. However, and this is where I slow down again, right? It isn't simply the obvious observation that the Psalms begin with questioning and end with praise, but rather this. They end with praise because they began with questioning and complaint and doubt. Because the road to praise frequently goes through suffering and doubt. So these Psalms witness to the fact that faith is always tested. There are no unambiguous proofs of God's actions or existence. So there will always be room for the questioning of God and God accepts that 
those questionings and expressions of doubt as honest actions of worship. Now, just briefly, uh, much more briefly, I, I want to deal with two matters arising from what I've just done, this kind of quick survey of um, the book of Psalms. And the first of them is, how do we reconcile these Psalms of disorientation with Adventist views about doubt? Um, and when I say Adventist views about doubt, um, I have um, presented on the issue of the uh, Psalms of disorientation once or twice before. And uh, a response that I've had is that Ellen White tells us that we should never do this. So to doubt or not to doubt. Um, some of the quotations that have been brought forward to me are these. She says, every thought of doubt should be so guarded that it will not see the light of day by utterance. One word of doubt, one word of evil thinking and evil speaking makes room for more of the same kind. It is seed sowing that will prepare for a harvest that few will care to garner. You hurt the heart of Christ by doubting. Should we ever doubt, if express any doubt? Some would say, well, obviously not. But of course, there are two columns here. And when we come to the book of Psalms, what do we read? Well, just very briefly, without wanting to do, uh, repeat too much, we hear, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me from the words of my groaning? How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? Why do you, for why do you hide your face? Why do you forget our affliction and oppression? The darkness is my closest friend. Well, it would seem to me that these are expressions of doubt. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It means you're doubting that he's with you. Will you forget me forever? It means he's forgetting and not remembering. Why do you hide your face? Well, he's hiding his face. He's not showing it. And the darkness is my closest friend. Now, um, my in principled position would be that we need to understand Ellen White in the light of the Psalms rather than vice versa. And I think that what Ellen White probably has in mind is rather than what we might think of as honest doubt is skepticism, an attitude which is always looking to see something negative. And in that sense, Yes, but we can hardly say, I would say, that we, when Ellen White says, do not doubt, I don't think we can really take that to mean never question or doubt in that sense, because that is precisely what the Psalms do. And they do it in public worship. And one other thing too, is that all of these psalms of disorientation, they never doubt God's existence. These are not psalms written by atheists or agnostics. These are psalms written by believers. They are all addressed to God. My God, my God, how long, O Lord? So these psalms do not doubt God's existence, but they do question his ways. And it presents these as an act of worship to God. Now, just as an, uh, to illustrate how far removed we are from this kind of thing, 
Um, the Psalms of Disorientation are the largest single category of Psalm. There are more Psalms of Disorientation than there are Psalms of Orientation. More Psalms of Disorientation than Psalms of Reorientation. In the back of the SDA church hymnal, I recognize that in many churches, the hymnal may never have seen the light of day for a couple of decades, but it has a useful index at the back of the hymnal in which it lists uh, scriptural passages which are alluded to or paraphrased in the hymns in the hymn book. There are, according to that index, about 370 references, citations and paraphrases of the Psalms in the hymns in the SDA hymn book. How many of those 370 allusions to the book of Psalms are to lines of disorientation, the largest single category of Psalm? And in case, well, I'll tell you, because I've checked. It comes to a grand total of zero. Not a single one. And yet, they are the largest category of psalm. So it isn't just, I think, this isn't just an Adventist thing, of course. I think it's contemporary Christianity in general. Now, we have censored disorientation. So this is the last thing I'm going to look at. I, I recognize um, I'm running over time here. Um, but the last thing I want to do briefly, since we've censored disorientation in worship, is to ask the question, what happens when we censor disorientation? So this is not a list of absolutes, but it's a list of possibilities that when we censor disorientation. First of all, I think God becomes a tyrant who tolerates no questioning. Sit down, do as you're told, I'm God. I'm not going to take that kind of questioning from you. The follow on from that also is that it encourages a form of church governance that also tolerates no questioning. Because there, is, there would be a temptation for custodians of the church, church administrators and leaders, who represent that kind of God to also not tolerate any kind of questioning. So that would be closed down. There would be a, a temptation to do so, I think. Uh, Walter Brueggemann says this. You may think this is an extreme statement. We'll see what you think. The absence of lament, by which he means disorientation. The absence of disorientation makes a religion of coercive obedience the only possibility. Coercive, because whether you are convinced or not, you have to obey. It means a diminished sensitivity to matters of justice. Why? Because many of the psalms of disorientation arise in contexts of perceived injustice. Shut down psalms of disorientation, worship of disorientation, and you get fewer expressions about the problems of injustice. It also encourage or could encourage a faith in the status quo. Because if matters cannot be questioned, then they cannot be changed. You just accept that what is will always be. And finally, I think it discourages authenticity in our spiritual lives. I return to those well-meaning, wonderful worship leaders. If I am told that I must be smiling when I worship, when I actually feel like weeping, 
then my worship and my spirituality is neither honest nor transparent. Okay, I'll leave it there. So.